Welcome to the Check Your Head podcast, where musicians share their mental health stories, experiences, and most importantly, their solutions to their mental health issues. I'm Mari Fong. I'm a music journalist and a life coach for musicians. And in today's episode, we'll be talking with singer-songwriter Kat Jensen, formerly of the band Love Toys, and who has also worked with greats such as Don Henley of the Eagles and the one and only Paul McCartney. So Kat shares her story of depression. And my great co-host today is Tony Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, He's the president of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance here in a local chapter in Los Angeles. And uh, it's also known as, as DBSA. So welcome to the podcast, Tony, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Mari. It's, it's an honor. So uh, let's hear Kat Jensen's story. And this all began when she was about 12 years old. When I first had an inkling that there was something wrong um, with depression, I was probably in the age group of 11 or 12. But at the time, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it was. This is not something that says, oh, gee, by the way, you're depressed. This is something that, you know, just is a part of um, everyday life for me. I didn't know. I know I felt different, that I was different. I felt a uh, lack of motivation. I didn't feel like myself. Mm-hmm. I wanted to sleep more. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through a time where I just, like, was watching TV a whole lot, you know, just kind of sitting there and ruminating, just kind of buzzed into the television set. And um, I ate a lot of root beer floats, I can tell you that. I just kept going back for ice cream and root beer. (laughs) That actually sounds pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, it was. It was pretty magical at the time, you know, because I was trying to fix something, apparently. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know... Video games weren't really big when I was a kid. They were starting to get big, but, you know, I was kind of broke. And so TV and video, or TV and um, root beer floats worked for me. Well, you know, they say that when people are depressed, either they lose their appetite or they they eat a lot. Oh, it was a sugar high, definitely. Okay. Like, like, like 10 root beer floats. Really? I mean, I should have owned an A&W franchise. (laughs) Okay. It would have been cheaper. Well, was there something going on during that time in your life that might have triggered that? Or do you think maybe it was hormonal changes? You know, that is kind of like the age of puberty. And, you know, a lot of um, young adults, when they go through that change, they start to have um, some mental health issues. Right. Um... I'm no doubt there was probably changes. Teenagers have a tough time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's tough enough to be a teenager and uh, go through that hormonal change. But mine was so distinctive because I really isolated. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and just going for root beer floats and watching TV all day is not really probably extremely healthy because of the isolation. And I think that these are big cues, you know, Mm -hmm. isolation, feeling different, not knowing what's wrong, lack of motivation, Mm -hmm. you know, all of these kinds of things. And the things that, as you asked, may have been going on, I have a family history. My, uh, My mother was schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. Um, She had previously been a drug addict. I'd been a foster child. I'd been, you know, I'd gone through a lot by the time I was the age of 12. I was probably like a 50-year-old in a 12-year-old body. So do you, with your mom having her mental, uh, her mental health challenges with schizophrenia, do you feel like you almost had to parent yourself? Did you feel like you were alone in oh, that absolutely. sense? Or was your father able to kind of step in and and do anything to help you out. You know, what's kind of amazing is is that families often have a dynamic, and part of that dynamic can be a lot of denial. Mm-hmm. Because when it's something that you don't understand, you just don't open a can of worms, you know? And um, oddly enough, my father was a physician 
but yet he couldn't treat his own family. He worked three jobs. He worked to help uh, children with cancer. He opened it. He had his own uh, practice, mm -hmm. and he had patients in the hospital, and that took, you know, a majority of his time. And uh, I don't fault him for that. He was giving it of himself to other people in the world. But I'll tell you, you know, families often don't see what's right in front of them and until it becomes so unmanageable. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this is, you know, finally my mother did become very unmanageable and that led to, you know, hospitalizations and ultimately to um, some, you know, finally in her later years, she got, you know, the help that she needed and lived out the rest of her life fairly sane. But that doesn't happen for everyone. And there's a lot that, that leads up to that. So families do deal with mental illness and it's not an easy thing to talk about. And for me, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, um, you know, here I am, you know, 12 years old, and, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like your mom might have taken out her frustrations on the family or, um, you know, as far as your upbringing, was that part of a traumatic experience that affected you later on with your depression? When when you deal with a family that has mental illness, first thing you have to really grasp is that the behavior is not typical. This is behavior that, you know, my mother actually thought that God was speaking to her through the television set, and she's s sending money to online preachers and doing things that most people would say that's just insanity, you know, you need to stop her. But you, when it's happening around you, you don't realize it because you're just too close. Mm -hmm. It's like being too close. And my mother also, you know, ran the roost, so to speak, in a lot of ways. So, you know, a lot of times you didn't really cross-examine. You didn't ask. You just went out through your life and kind of put blinders on. And I did. I put blinders on. I kept myself watching TV, I kept, you know, it's just like kids that do a lot of video games. It's the same idea. You just kind of check out. You just aren't there anymore. So that led me down the path to feel that I wasn't worth anything mm -hmm. and that I didn't really need to be here. And um, I would play guitar. I would um, try to wrap myself within everything that was about music because it took me away somewhere else. You so know, you, you were could, able to kind of escape yeah, with music I and maybe be distracted by what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of musicians also, when they have so much going on in their head, whether it's depression or whether it's excitement, they're able to express that through their music. I um, mean, yeah. did you find that to be something that you can... Yeah. Kind of oh, definitely. Um, a lot of musicians do um, escape that way. They go through and write or, you know, and I, I do believe that it was the beginning of my writing career. I did start to write because it was an expression outside of myself um, because no one could know what I was feeling inside. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't like everyone else. I did, wasn't the jocks. I wasn't the prom girls or the, you know, I wasn't popular. I just um, would write lyrics, play things on the guitar that made me feel, you know, and that's the way that I could cope. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I believe that a lot of musicians do cope that way because it's it's another reality. It's It takes you to another level. And, you know, it makes you feel as if um, nothing else can touch you. You're untouchable at that point. Now, at the time, you know, at 12 years old, you know, in your early teens, were you able to talk to anybody about it um, and let someone else know about what's going on with you? Not really. Not for me. Um, you know, I didn't get into therapy until I was much older, until I was in my 20s. But... um you know, earlier on, basically, you know what, is I found other people had the same kind of feelings as I did. It's like I didn't fit in with the, a lot of the high school kids that I knew 
that were, you know, as I said, jocks or something like that. But boy, when I got in with other musicians, it was almost like we knew each other really well. We knew each other's souls. You mm -hmm. could just pick up an instrument, a guitar, whatever, you know, and just start jamming. And it's like we knew each other. And um, that's why I do believe that we have a commonality. There's a common way of the way our brains think, the way we're wired. We're kind of hardwired. Well, they do say that um, musicians, creative people, have a much higher incidence of mental illness, depression being one of them. And, you know, some music was something that made you feel better. Were there any other things that you did to kind of kind of self-medicate yourself? Listen, you know, it was a time of, um, talk about medicating or whatever. It was a time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. You know, it's like uh, you got with a, other like-minded people, and you didn't really have to think. We kind of all had the same thing. We want to get up and rock. We want to get up and play. We want to get out there and enjoy and, you know, and forget about all that crazy stuff that's around. They're the ones that are crazy, not us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're just, we're living it. We're having a great time. And I believe that that's the reality that we all have in common. Mm -hmm. So it was a sense of camaraderie, a sense oh. of comfort, a sense of ex escape. But at the same time, you were expressing your feelings through music and you eventually started a band called love toys yep uh in the 90s and dig when, that name right i love the name <laughs> <laughs> yes uh do you know that we weren't able to play we were told that we, they wanted us to play some sort of a a catholic fiesta or some kind of thing like that and they booked us and then by the time we got out there to play they said oh no you got to change your name you can't come out here and play with that name <laughs> well um i think it's the coolest name ever <laughs> and um but the the idea was that we we are all kids at heart and mm -hmm. adults have toys. They got jet skis. They've got boats. They've got everything else. That was we love our toys. I love my guitars. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, about naughty stuff. It was about loving all the things in life and being a kid at heart. Right. Now you said that you uh, went out on tour. Yes. And um, you know played uh, music festivals, uh, Crew Fest, yes, uh, which was inspired by Motley Crue, mm -hmm. and. I'm wondering that lifestyle of being on tour, how did that affect your mental health? I would say, um, you know, at first with anything that happens, it's exciting. You know, I got it. I did that. Um, I also toured uh, the UK a little bit. And, um, you know, this it's all exciting at first. But eventually, these things that are deep inside are still there. And now you've got the accessibility of everything to try and numb yourself. You know, you've got, as I said before, sex, drugs, rock and roll. You've got all of that to numb yourself. And um, eventually the stress related to it, uh, the constantly having to be on even when you're having a shitty day or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, you have to still perform. They expect you to be, you know, on all the time. And that eventually gets to a person. I mean, I don't care who it is. And you'll see um, the more that, that is piled upon a person with all the responsibility. You know, first it's all fun and games. You're just rocking out. Next thing you know, it's a job. And it's like any other job. You're mm -hmm. working really hard. You now are branding yourself. And you're you're working as hard as any other CEO to, to make this thing happen. And you've got a lot on your head. And, uh, you know, you have to perform through all that. And some of us just quite frankly are, you know, we didn't set out really for that. It was just, you know, it's great. We all, all dream of stardom or we dream to, to, you know, tour or to do the things that we want to do. But there's also a lot of responsibility goes with that. And maybe we're not always prepared. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite what we may have thought. You know, you romance a lot of things in your mind. Well, that's the other thing is that the reality of being on tour is being on a tour bus with a bunch of other people and um, 
late nights and everybody wanting to party and maybe handing you a drink and handing you other things uh, because of that whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I could see where that could be a real, um, not a good situation. For- yeah. It, you know, that's the thing about it is that I think what they used to say, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? It's mm-hmm. like, you know, you have all these fantastic intentions of, yeah, I'm going to rock. I'm going to have a great time with everybody. and uh, But then, you know, next thing you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock comes along. You got to hit, you know, hit a plane at 6. You have to be fresh. And even a person in the most, you know, fantastic of physical shape in your early 20s is going to get tired. Eventually, you know, your body is finally going to tell you, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're kind of, you're doing a little too much and you need to knock it off. And and, and we don't listen half the time because mm-hmm. it's, it. I'm not going to lie to you, it's a fantastic ride. It's a great ride to, to do this job. Mm-hmm. But there's also the responsibility to yourself and you got to police your own health. You have to really look out for yourself. Well, can you think of a time where um, things got really bad with your depression to the point where you felt like you were at your lowest point? Yeah. I mean, depression has a way of lying to you. I know that it can take a person to their lowest point. Um, sometimes it's sneaky. I started off by kind of carving, started carving my arms. I'd have letters on my arms. I'd car- carve my name in my arms. That was so that I could actually feel what it was inside of me, that it, I could see when the blood ran that it was real. And I know that sounds difficult to understand, but sometimes you're in such a surreal world in your own mind and how your mind gets so hijacked the reality is hard to decipher so I had to look at my own arm to remind myself of the real pain that was there and that I needed help and um and it went on to the point to where you know I'll be candid and this is very hard for me to admit because there is a lot of stigma around it. But um, I wound up in the hospital because um, I tried to kill myself. And that takes, like, a lot for a person to get to that point. And all I can say is that God help you if you're in that uh, that point. And I want you to reach out and talk to someone because I don't wish that on anyone. I don't want anyone to suffer the way that I did. And, uh, you know, so suicide was what I thought was an option. And uh, Well, thank you for letting us know about that, because I know there are a lot of other musicians and people in general that get to that point. And it's important to know how you get to that point. Mine was um, kind of genetic. You know, I had a genetic predisposition for it. I had some things that would probably cause some post-traumatic stress, you know, Mm -hmm. that had happened Mm -hmm. in my life. These are triggers. These are things that now I know um, exist. But, um, you know, the important thing is to realize is that we can we could start to feel ourselves and start taking our own temperature and realize that we are worth it to um, to try to to police our own health. And so what were some of the things that were going through your head when you were in that condition? Because I know, like you said, depression kind of lies to you mm-hmm. and tells you things that are not really true, but they feel like it's, it, it feels like the truth when you're in it. Well, the lies that depression can tell you are usually based around usually the isolation or the loneliness or the the sense of feeling that no one else feels like you do you know it has a way of keeping you away from others that may feel like you do um and it feels as if you're having the most unique experience because it'll sit there and just tell you you're ugly it'll tell you you're too fat it'll tell you you're too thin it'll tell you 
uh, I mean, any number of things. I'm sure anybody could go through a list and say, okay, what are the most horrible things that you can say about yourself? And here they are, you know, and they feel very real as if that, that no one's ever going to accept you or to understand where you are. And, um, and you know, the crazy part of it is, is that it's not like you're telling yourself these things. It's as if they're an honest belief. The mm -hmm. belief is already there. You're like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to be alone forever, unlovable. I'm not going to, you know, and you just play, you play shit games on your head, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't even know I was doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the part. So it's it's being able to get with your own head and say, wait a minute. You got to start saying, you know, there are some lies here. And let's start calling the lies out. So what was the turning point when you finally got help or someone finally discovered what was going on with you? To give you help. Yeah, I'd been in the hospital more than once. I started um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Not CBD, CBT. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, um, yeah, it, I guess eventually I knew it wasn't working anymore. And um, nothing was going to, to, to change any of it. You know, they often say that to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is kind of insanity, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was sick and tired of being insane. Um, and um, I just kind of said, you know, I, I, it can't get any worse than this. I've been laid out on my bed watching TV for hours, can't move. Um, I'm basically kind of a waste of space at this moment so can only go up from here you know but it's not like you just have an epiphany it's it's not that easy I wish I could tell you it was it's not mm -hmm. you have to like start doing little things one thing at a time one day at a time and what was CBD CBT I mean uh, cognitive, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy, therapy. Tell me a little bit about that and how it helped you. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy helps you deal with what's happening basically in the present. It kind of keeps you uh, aware of your behaviors and what you have control over, what you don't have control over. And um, we have to think of life that, you know, um, if you live in the past and you start focusing on regrets or you focus on... Um, how things should have been different or could have been different or what you could have been or what others could have done or any of that, you live in the past, that's going to create a lot of depression for you. Um, if you try to extend yourself and live so far in the future, you think, well, well, if only I could this in the future, if I meet the right person or do the right this or that, or I go to school for that or whatever, if you start borrowing from the future, that creates a lot of anxiety. So I was always pulled between anxiety and depression. And um, I had to begin to realize that, you know, what, wait a minute, I can't be on the end of the scale either which way. You know, the way to get healthy is to get in the middle and start saying, I got to live right here in the present. And um, you know what? Give yourself a break. Depression robs you. It's a thief. It robs you of your abilities. It robs you of your future. It screws you over with the past. It does all of these things to you, and it wins. So, you know, for me... The best thing to do was to say, you know, I, I can visit these ideas, but I can't live there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take one day at a time right here. And I think that's why a lot of 12-step programs stick with one day at a time is because that's all we really have. We only have today. So if you can just deal with it, deal with yourself, and give yourself a fucking break, man, really. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we're down on ourselves. We feel like, well, you know, I, I should have done this, and I should have done that, you know? Well, if you have depression, it's hard enough to get out of bed, mm -hmm. you know? But you know what? If you give yourself a break every day, getting out of bed will get easier. 
little steps. Right. And so with musicians that are out there that are listening right now that feel hopeless, that feel depressed, um, what advice would you give to them or what would you say to them to help bring them some comfort and hope? I say, man, you know what? Um, You know how it is that... um, we kind of stepped out on a limb when we went out and just kind of played in front of people for the first time. And, you know, we kind of showed that vulnerability to others to just do what we do. It takes a lot to get out of your bedroom and just, you know, play for people. But it's something we know as a musician you got to do. It's just, it's a part of your, it's a part of you. You know it is. And, uh, Take that same part of yourself and realize that there's more, there's help. There is, you know, a way to deal with these feelings where you don't have to go down the rabbit hole. You don't have to, like, do a bunch of drugs or drink yourself to death. You don't have to lie on the couch and, you know, dream your life away. Um, Just to dig deep and find that part of yourself because I know it's there. It's there in you, and I know it's there in me. And you're not alone at all. I have to ask you this because (laughs) I know you're surrounded by people who love you and um, friends, family. While you're going through your mental health journey, who was it that really listened and was able to help you? I would say I had faith for one. And I started trying to grow it. I started trying to have more meditation time. So I think I started listening more to myself than I ever had. And um, I also took a chance with therapists that were very, very good at what they do. And I did have to trust And I did have to, I mean, I didn't have a lot of money for therapy. I took uh, therapists that were willing to see me on um, a sliding scale, which means they take you, you know, based on what you earn. And for me, it was like zilch. So, you know, they worked for almost free. (laughs) But, you know, I took the chance and I realized that it's a, a long journey. This is not something that happens overnight. So you... So I took myself as the one to, um, and and that's basically what you've got to do. Um, Others can help support you, but, you know, there are naysayers going to be around you that don't understand what you're going through. There are very many people that don't understand mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when people don't understand something, they balk Mm -hmm. at it. You know, they say, oh, you're faking or you're just lazy or you don't know what you're talking about or, you know, or, or, or they don't know what to say. And they just kind of walk off and then kind of don't talk to you as much mm-hmm. anymore. Like, oh, you're just that weird person, right? So, ah, well, I've always been weird. What so, would you have but... liked somebody to say if you did, you know, ask for help and reached out to someone? What would you want them to say to you? I would want them to let me know that I'm safe and they're not going to go put it on social media or go talking to people. I would really, you know, feel that it would be wonderful if they could just say, look, you know, I don't know what you're going through. They don't have to because I don't know what I'm going through half the time. But listen, you want to ride to the therapist, you want to talk about it if you don't want to talk about it. You want to get some coffee? You want me to leave you alone for a little bit, but I'm going to call you in 20 minutes? You know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, just to know that you're not alone in this thing. Mm -hmm. Because you're not. Well, Kat, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I know that I was touched by it and learned a lot from you. Um, Is there anything else that you would like to say uh, or, or mention about your story that that you'd like to uh, let people know about? Well, I guess um, I want to say, you know, there's different kinds of depression. Mine was a kind of a genetic, but it was also situational because of the hardships in my family. Um, Some people have 
a situation, maybe they've had people die or other hardships in their life, and you go through a phase of depression or, you know, everyone may know what it feels like to be depressed at some point in time in their life. But basically, it's kind of like, when does it get in the way of your life? When does it become something that goes past anything that may be considered kind of normal or temporary. And I like to say it's a lot like a Marshall amp, you know, if it goes to 11, you know, and, and we have a volume knob on this depression thing or any other mental illness, you know, if it's going to 11, I mean, you better start talking to somebody or do something, get out there. If it's a family member, if it's a friend, if it's don't be afraid to talk about it. Let's get over the stigma. Mm -hmm. Let's not have a stigma about this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we've lost so many greats. Look at poor Chris C Cornell, you know, suffered with depression a lot of his life. And we have tragic endings. There is, mm -hmm. this has to stop. We've got mm -hmm. teenagers right now that are very, mm -hmm. very highly creative and mm -hmm. trying to do music and, and be artists and, and, you know, this is too much and too long. We need to open it up. Let's talk about it. Let's get it out there. And let's stop hiding. Let's just be human. And let's get to the point And let's get well together. Thank you so much, Kat. And now, one of my favorite parts of the podcast is you are going to play an acoustic song. Yeah, this one's called One and Only. <clears throat> It's kind of a love song. It's a little bit of a love song about someone else, but also for yourself. Because you are your one and only. And uh, so, kind of goes a little bit like this.
Now, Tony, some of the things that Kat mentioned in her story included uh, things like family history of mental illness, uh, especially on her mom's side, mm -hmm. uh, cutting, uh, a suicide attempt, uh, and also cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which uh, ended up helping her uh, with her depression. So what are some of the thoughts that you have on her story? It's amazing. There is a genetic connection with bipolar and depression. So it's in her family history. So it's not a surprise that it would show up in her. And CBT is really important. It helps you stay in the now. You don't focus on the past and you don't focus on the future. You stay in the now, and that's critical uh, to keep your sanity. Yeah, I am really excited that uh, she's gone through this mental health journey and then she's come out the other end and has really yes. uh, learned to live a life with a condition that can be fatal. Yeah, she's definitely a survivor. She is a survivor and she's been really persistent in finding the mental help that she needs. Yeah. You are uh, part of DBSA. Can you tell me about the organization and how it could support musicians who might be suffering from depression? Well, when, when you connect with other people that have the same condition, it's um, you're basically connecting with, with a lifeline. You're providing a... You're in a forum for mutual acceptance and understanding and self-discovery, whether you live with the mood disorder or you're a parent, or you have a family or friend, a family member or a friend that, that has it. So they're all welcome in the groups. The whole thing is to learn and uh, share experiences about that. So it's a sense of camaraderie, a sense of understanding, and people just being really vulnerable about um, what's going on with them, which, like you said, connects people and makes people feel maybe not so alone. Because oftentimes in depression, people feel disconnected. Yes, yes. It's kind of like a long-term suicide prevention strategy. So thank you so much, Tony, uh, from the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance and um, musician Kat Jensen for sharing her story. And until next time, uh, be brave, ask for help, and be persistent in finding the mental help that you need. Check Your Head is kindly supported by Sweet Relief Musicians Fund, Lemon Tree Studios in Los Angeles, and other kind donors and sponsors. Visit CheckYourHeadPodcast.com where you'll find more resources for mental help. And please subscribe to our podcast, especially on our Patreon page, uh, where we've got all kinds of gifts and goodies for you. Also, find us on social media on Facebook and Instagram.